where someone was creating multiple online identities, their home identity, in a sense, who they really are in the real world, looked quite different from all the other identities. And although this is just a case study, that might be a real clue for investigators as to how to start tracking down these anonymous online criminals. I'm America's Digital Pro, Kim Commando, and welcome to a podcast that provides in-depth insight into the ever-changing technology landscape and the impact it has on your life. You'll hear from tech industry experts, movers, and shakers. And in this podcast, you're going to learn about the clues investigators found in the Warcraft text murder that helped catch and prosecute Kimberly Proctor's killers. Now, in part one of this two-part series, we took a look at the possible connection between violent online games and mass murder. And to be fair, there are valid expert arguments on both sides of the fence. 60% of Americans play video games regularly, according to ProCon.com. The majority of them aren't dangerous, but a number of them are. The dangerous ones tend to hang out in chat rooms designed for people who are into violent sex acts and torture. I normally stay away from these topics on my podcast as a rule, but keep in mind this is a tech podcast, but I think it's important for all of us to be aware. The FBI has issued a warning that sexual predators use video games to connect with kids. It's very possible that if you play violent video games, someone you know online may actually be into some pretty dangerous stuff. So for your safety, you need to catch the clues, disengage, and actually even report them. And that's what this podcast is all about. I'm going to unpack the Warcraft text murder case from an internet detective's point of view. You're going to learn about all the clues that pinpoint to a potentially deadly situation. And I have to warn you, this podcast contains some graphic and disturbing audio. We also don't recommend this episode for younger kids or for people who are sensitive to topics like murder and rape. So listen at your own discretion. This story has been in the national news, but what hasn't been divulged that we're going to talk about on this podcast is what led investigators to a successful prosecution. And my whole point in this podcast is to point the clues out to you so that you are aware of them, if in fact you see them, and also... You can talk to your kids and family members about these clues, because knowledge is power. But first, we have to take a moment to thank one of our partners in this podcast, because they help make this podcast possible. All right, welcome back. Mass shootings are getting deadlier and more frequent. The FBI reports that active shooter incidents have more than doubled from the year 2000 to 2015. Four of the deadliest shootings in U.S. history have been within the past five years. Gosh, and 2017 topped the all-time casualty count. Now, all but three of the shooters were men between the ages of 20 and 49, and they all apparently had these unstable backgrounds or even a criminal record. While mass shootings seem to be the choice of violent criminals these days, by far, it isn't their only activity. In some cases, violent video games are also a part of their regular routine. Is there a connection? Okay. Some experts say yes. Others say no. But for two particular teenage boys, Cameron Moffat and Cruz Wellwood, World of Warcraft, the game, was a huge part of their life. Cruz and Cameron were responsible for the horrific rape and murder of a beautiful young woman, a gal by the name of Kimberly Proctor. Let's listen to the news report. Then, we're going to track down the digital evidence that led to their arrest. Good evening. A Langford family is devastated after learning that the victim of a horrific murder in Colwood is indeed their daughter. The remains of 18-year-old Kimberly Proctor were found burned beneath a bridge on the Galloping Goose Trail in Colwood on Friday night. Kimberly Proctor was looking forward to graduating from high school this spring. She was a teen who, like many, loved her computer, loved her pets, and thought a great deal of her friends. Her identity was not confirmed until late last night when the family got the news. Today, West Shore RCMP say the 
search for her killer is their highest priority. There are dozens of investigators working around the clock on the case. They are following up every lead and tip, no matter how seemingly small. And tonight, as they hunt for her killer, they're asking for your help as they try to track where Kimberly was, when, and with whom. At first, investigators had no idea who killed Kimberly, but they certainly had clues. Texts were on her cell phone, but it was in code words and comments used by friends on World of Warcraft. Clues on social media, chat rooms, and texts provided investigators with enough information to track down her killers. Because the killers loved the game World of Warcraft, much of the evidence for this case was discovered right there. Now, on the flip side, investigators believe that Warcraft may have been a contributing factor in the murder itself. Kimberly Proctor was bullied most of her life, according to her mother. So when her mom sent her to a new alternative school, You can understand why she wanted so badly to be liked. She and Cruz Wellwood, her future killer, they actually became online friends, and here's where clue number one comes in. She opened up her heart to him in text messages and chats. They shared secrets and insecurities like teens have. But the closer they got, the weirder his text became. Cruz admitted to becoming violent and explosive, but... Kim just blew it off with a LOL. When Cruz told her that she was too good a person, that she trusted other people too much, she just shrugged it off. She wanted to believe the best in people. She had no idea that his communication style, from a linguistic point of view, went into danger. She also didn't know that while their friendship was growing, a plan was also growing in the minds of Cameron and Cruz. And it was a violent plan. The two boys were into some really scary stuff online. And here's where another clue comes in. Their game posts, texts, and chats revealed that they had started experimenting with really gruesome activities like drinking blood and bodily fluids. They were visiting sadistic porno sites and fantasizing about bondage and rape. Then Kim got a super scary text message from Cruz's friend Cameron. You're going to die. That was the final clue. Well, it was more like a warning. Now, I don't know about you, but when I get a message that threatens my life, I take it seriously, and you should too. But many peer-driven, people-pleasing teenagers, like Kimberly, she continued to believe in the best in people. Cruz sent her a text next, asking if they could meet in person. What are you doing tomorrow? Nothing, other than babysitting at three. I'm bored, and I was looking for someone to chill with today. I also wanted to apologize. Oh? Whatever happened to Kim? You deserve nothing. You kill your rabbit. I'd rather talk in person over a couple of bowls before babysitting. I gotta say that when I saw your text, I was shocked and confused. Unbeknownst to Kimberly, while they were chatting, Cameron and Cruz were texting back and forth. Again, please brace yourself for this unpleasant, extremely graphic description. The two are chatting online, and part of that conversation reads, Cameron Moffat, I guess we plan for it, but we keep our eyes open. Cruz Wellwood, this is so funny. Jam a funnel in her and fill it with water. When you're done, pour Drano in her. I am going to rip her nose ring out and burn it, burn her flesh. Moffat, I want to get it done. I don't want to wait. I'm not killing her right away, says Wellwood. Moffat asks, you're not going to keep her bound and alive? That's what I'm going to do, Wellwood replies, but I need to get her stoned first and possibly seduce her. Try quickly, Moffat laughs. Then Wellwood lays out exactly when the brutal killing will begin. I'll say, I think I'm going to make some KD when I'm going to attack her. All Moffat can think of then? I wonder if she has money and stuff, he says. I'm going to take stuff. Well, I'll take whatever she has. Later, that same day, the two teens kill the girl. Now, normally, this kind of evidence would not be released to the public, but Kimberly's parents made it clear. They want people to know what these two were like. If you think vicious or weird texts are not that big of a deal, think again. You could be overlooking a potential sex trafficking situation, or at worst, a deadly one. Investigators found clues that the teens had planned the killing online. They used code words to initiate the attack, instructions on where they would hide the body and what kind of fuel they would use to burn her. Those messages were collected by police, analyzed by a linguistic forensic team, and 
used by prosecutors to arrest the murderers. And here's an important clue. After the murder, Cruz tried to cover up his part in the killing by sending a text to Kimberly. He asked her if she's done babysitting, but he knew better. Having suffered one of the most brutal, unthinkable rape, torture, and murder sessions on record, she was stuffed in his freezer to be burned later. Now, I'm going to take the high road and spare you the details of what exactly happened to Kimberly. The point is, there were clues from the very beginning that Cruz had a good chance of becoming a murderer. In fact, here's a clue. He took an online quiz to find out if he fit the bill. Cruz then posted his results on a WordPress blog entitled, Early Warning Signs of a Serial Killer. The traits included animal abuse, fascination with fire, abandonment by a father, an intense interest in sadomasochistic porn. He posted, and I quote, The particular thing is, I meet all 14 criteria, and I suppose only time will tell. All right, here's another clue. Cruz Wellwood's father sexually assaulted and murdered a 16-year-old girl. He was sentenced to life with no possibility of parole for 15 years. Family history can sometimes play a significant part in the making of a killer. If someone has given you the willies, use technology to help you investigate. With advanced searches, you can find arrest records, criminal records, family histories, gaming affiliations, chat rooms, and social media profiles. And if you can't do it yourself, hire either a private eye or an ethical hacker to help you out. Cameron Moffat, on the other hand, was sexually abused at a young age. And according to a psychologist, he began jumping out of his window at night. Cameron resisted counseling and any type of medication. He got into cutting and finally started bringing a knife to school. In Cameron's case, nobody knew better about his potential for harm than his health professionals and his very own family. A psychology professor at the University of Victoria says that it's hard to tell which aggressive kid is going to take the fantasies of video games and try them out in reality. But then she goes on to say that in Cameron Moffat and Cruz Wellwood's case, there would have been clues, which, as you know, there were. And we're going to give you more about those clues, ones that you might never, ever suspect after we hear a quick message from one of our sponsors in this podcast. Okay, you're back. When there's a murder, forensic experts can get in there and collect physical evidence. And a lot of times that's enough to convict a killer. But in Kimberly's case, her body was burned. There was no concrete evidence at first to convict the two boys. So can a murderer be identified just by text messages and posts and what's going on inside chat rooms? The answer is yes. Just as a forensic team searches for physical evidence, language science and technology also help solve crimes. Linguistic detectives are really so-called word scientists in that they look for clues in ransom notes and text threats, social media profiles and chats, to help them determine the sender's state of mind, and that's important. Some of the things they look for are speech cadence or certain terms from a specific region. For instance, a drinking fountain in one part of the country might be a spigot somewhere else. Time differences are also a factor. What time was the text sent? Did the person appear to be in an afternoon frame of mind, or was it more like an evening text? In other words... There's a difference between grabbing a cup of coffee and relaxing with a cup of tea. People do these things at different times of the day. So let's hear from forensic linguist Professor Tim Grant. He's the director of Ashton University's Center for Forensic Linguistics, which is the first of the kind in the world. Tim uses a scientific approach to language to help convict criminals. His specialty is short-form messages like text, Twitter posts, and emails. His expertise has helped bring criminals to justice in some very high-profile cases, from anonymous harassment to murders to threats of terrorism. He was interviewed by Aston scholars, but they cut the interviewer out. So for the purposes of this podcast, I'm just going to ask the questions. So, Professor Grant, what is your actual job title? 
I'm a forensic linguist, and that means that I'm interested in how language works in uh, forensic contexts. So we sometimes look at texts like ransom notes or suicide notes or threatening letters, and sometimes we help the police with the language of the police interview or in other areas in the judicial context. What's your primary focus these days? I'm particularly interested in short electronic communications like Twitter and text messaging and Facebook updates. And so we're looking at very, very short texts and working out who wrote them. And we've developed methods and had research projects looking at how we can do the authorship analysis work on those very short texts. And what do you aim to achieve through your work? The real impact that we look for is to improve the delivery of justice, and that's the real prize that we aim at. So if we're working in the police interview context, that's allowing witnesses to have their proper voice, and they might be vulnerable witnesses, they might be second language users, so the interview might require an interpreter in the room, and all that changes the dynamic. So we study that context and we help train the police in how to better uh, conduct their police interviews. Give us an example of how it works in terms of language analysis. So we had a case a few years ago now where a conspiracy to murder was in East London street slang. The conspiracy to murder was also done over internet relay chat. So two kids from the East End in London were chatting with one another and they were using East London street slang based in Jamaican English. So the threat to kill was actually in the phrase, I'll get the fiend to duppy her den. A fiend is a drug addict and a duppy is a ghost in Jamaican English. So to duppy someone might be to turn someone into a ghost. And that was the conspiracy to murder, and we took our evidence of meaning to court and helped secure a conviction. Now, at the time of this interview, he and his colleague Emily were working on a very interesting but pressing case of a man who was interacting with underage children using, get this, 17 different online personas. Listen to how Emily was able to see patterns between the personas and spot connections between them, eventually identifying the offender. So the first key finding was that the majority of the personas that he used were actually quite consistent, but one of them seemed to stick out in terms of the linguistic patterns and moves that he used. So for the majority of the personas, they were taking this very sort of direct, aggressive approach um, to victims and introducing sexual topics very quickly and that kind of thing, um, and using more moves like extortion in the conversations. And this other persona um, looked quite different in that he spent much more time building rapport with that one, um, and it looked more concerned with the kind of development of friendships and perhaps romantic relationships and it didn't use those aggressive moves in the way that the other personas did. On closer inspection it looked like this one this one persona was giving away little bits of identifying information about the offender so he was giving a um, misvocation and the name of his workplace um, and his sort of home living area so we started to wonder if this is perhaps the persona that best reflects what we might consider the offender's offline identity. Tim what was the takeaway in that case? Where someone was creating multiple online identities, their home identity, in a sense, who they really are in the real world, looked quite different from all the other identities. And although this is just a case study, that might be a real clue for investigators as to how to start tracking down these anonymous online criminals. Okay, that was cool. So many gems in that one interview. Now, we can't mention linguistics without talking about retired FBI agent James Fitzgerald, one of the greatest linguistics investigators of the modern world. He was involved in so many famous cases, John Benet Ramsey, the Unabomber Ted Kaczynski come to mind. This guy is really good. He owns the Academy Group, which is the world's largest privately owned forensic behavioral science firm made up of former FBI and VSP profilers and linguists. Here he talks about a special database they have, gathered from the private sector, which contains all the phrases, grammatical styles, and slang terms used in threat communication. So if someone is a known threat and uses certain mannerisms or language styles, the database can help track them down. I would come up with some language features. I didn't use a lightning bug on that, but a few other features. And I would say, hey, I need you to look for this sentence, this phrase, this clause. And she would sit and type. And sometimes I would get a hit and we could help us match cases then. But in many times, it would help us reinforce how rare that particular type of feature was of the thousands and thousands of different threatening communications in there. So now that with my, I'm in my company, the Academy Group in Manassas, Virginia, we've since now have a private sector corpus, which is a collection of, of documents. And we now do the same 
same sort of searches. So when I'm working my forensic linguistic cases, I will call our analyst and say, hey, can you look up this term or this even unusual? Who uses two semicolons in a row? Do we have any examples of that? And we can search that by every way, stretch, and means, and uh, that can help us strengthen the case. Or maybe it'll show us, oh, no, you know what? We have so many common usages, it doesn't really mean anything here. So, uh, of course, we have computer experts who can search all elements of the web, the dark underside of the web. Amazing. The search capabilities are far beyond what the public knows about. I can guarantee it. And while those interviews don't even begin to describe the technology involved in linguistics analysis, hopefully they give you an idea of what to look for within your own online community. Now, I know that murder is a disturbing topic. And just to be honest, it was really hard for me to pull these two podcasts together. My heart goes out to the Proctor family who will never, ever get over such a loss. But it's important. Part of mastering technology is understanding both the depths and heights of where it could potentially lead. See, technology helps us solve unsolvable crimes. Just look at DNA analysis. We can tell so much about a person just by a strand of hair. If you have a drop of blood from someone, it's like having a portrait and a history, all in that one drop. And it's getting that way with texting, posts, and email. With technology, we can find out an awful lot about someone from just a short note. And it's good to see someone come to justice, but I'd rather see someone be stopped before they have a chance. I'd rather see you open your eyes to the tech clues all around you. And parents and grandparents, who's ever watching the kids, don't be afraid to monitor posts, texts, emails, and chat rooms. The kids may be friends with someone you've never met. Technology is not there to shut you out of your child's life, but to invite you in to learn more about their life. So be on the lookout for clues. Do the hard thing. And being aware of your surroundings is important. But seriously, what surrounds you and the kids more than anything else these days? It's crazy. It's technology. So you have to get in there and learn. And a good way to start is to subscribe to these podcasts, whether on Google Play, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcasts. This way, you're going to learn all you can while you can. I'd like to thank the Proctors for making their audio from the investigation public so that everyone can learn from it. I also want to say a big thank you to James Fitzgerald, the Ashton Scholars, and Tim Grant for being an essential part of this podcast. And if you like this podcast, do me a huge favor. Be sure that you share it with your family members and friends. And also give us a great five-star rating and a five-star review over on iTunes, Google Play, or again, wherever you get your podcasts. And thanks for listening.